Sunday, this day close to 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ fulfilled prophecy by riding into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey, and a little one of those, a humble entrance. Scores of Jews nevertheless hailed him as their leader, their prophet, waving and shouting and laying palms at his back. Just a few days later, the same Jesus was rushed through a sham trial, headed to a rendezvous with eternity that would lift him from the earth by a cruel cross. When a Roman leader gave the Hebrews the opportunity to save the Messiah, they'd enthusiastically greeted just a little time before, they hated him and forced the official to free a murderer instead. The world is fickle. One day it's in an uproar over some comment that offended someone else. Next, it could be fastened on the first lady's outfit. After that, an iceberg floating off into an ocean. But we Christians have to keep our gaze on Jesus Christ fixed to the end. Our message today is whether hated or hailed, keep the faith. Drawing on Mark 11, Matthew 26, and 2 Timothy 4. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Oh, Father God, we thank you for this Palm Sunday. Help us to have perfect vision for what you want us to do on this earth in fulfilling the Great Commission. I pray each one would be touched by your spirit, filled with your spirit. If necessary, saved then filled, Lord God. The time is short, the work is much, the laborers few. Let's go out into that harvest, Lord God, but let us be set upon you and nothing else ahead. In Christ's name I pray, amen. We look first into the Gospels at Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. And so Jesus is coming into the great and holy eternal city, Jerusalem. This is during the Passover week, Holy Week, as we would call it now. And the first two verses of that chapter, now when they, the disciples and Jesus, drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. Jesus came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, the deliverance of the Jews from the Egyptian plagues some long time before. Now, this passage is related to an Old Testament prophecy from Zechariah 9.9. It reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Not even a horse. It's a foal of a donkey. Oh, how humble. This is but one of the hundreds of prophecies Christ fulfilled in his short life of about 33 years, and even shorter ministry of three and a half. John 12, 16 tells us that his disciples did not understand these things, these prophecies being fulfilled at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Even in our lives, when a word may be fulfilled, or we get an answer to prayer, we may not realize that immediately, but the Holy Spirit brings us to that remembrance often so that we are able to celebrate the goodness of the Lord, give a praise report, tell what God has done in our situations to others to encourage them, and that we are built up in our own faith. God has spoken so much good into our lives. We need to celebrate him for it. Mark 11, 3 says, And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here, Jesus said. Christ prepared the disciples for this. He would give them favor with others so they could go about fulfilling God's word. Now, he still does this through the Holy Spirit today. He's given us the scripture, the unchanging word of God, which cannot be null and void, which is living and active, sharp as a two-edged sword. It has nearly 3,600 promises in it, about 10 for every day of the year. Have you celebrated your 10 promises today? <laughs> I've celebrated a few. I don't know if I'm a 10 yet, but then the day isn't over. But we can celebrate Jesus in every way, every day. 
and he's given us plenty of material to draw on. Mark 11, 4 to 7 reads, So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat upon it. In those days, putting clothes on the colt was to show humility and reverence in the presence of royalty, making sure they didn't get their clothes dirty. They had a nice soft place to ride. In our time, we should be willing to yield whatever we have to the Lord's service, making him comfortable in our surroundings, making his way easy, revering him. And this is an amazing scene just described because just a few days later, these same people say, crucify him. We're so changeable. But God, thanks be to him, is unchanging. He's stable. We can count on him. And let us, especially we who are believers, try to be consistent. Our yes being yes and our no being no, as in James 5.12. Mark 11, 8 says, And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. These were palms, hence the name of this weekend's occasion, Palm Sunday. Traditionally, churches burn those palms the following year for Ash Wednesday services. Ashes are a sign of mourning and repentance and start off Lent. And many times the priest or pastor will make the sign of the cross with ashes on a church member's forehead as a sign that they have gone to Ash Wednesday services. And this is good. We need to have the sign of the cross with us. It's fine to wear crosses. I do that sometimes where you have a collar. If you so choose, if you're a pastor, you could also have Christian t-shirts. But the best kind of sign is that we have been changed. We have a changed life into the Holy Spirit's fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Doesn't mean there's not a thing like godly anger. Doesn't mean that everybody's just nice and cushy all the time. But it does mean that that's going to be speaking the truth in love so that people hopefully will repent and get right with God. Or Mark eleven nine 9 reads, Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means please save or praise God, as the people realized they had transcendent greatness. In their bitch. This just wasn't another king like an Antiochus Epiphanes who is so evil, the role model of the 666 fame. Nor even was it King David, who is a, a good and just king who was after God's heart. No, this was somebody who is eternal in every way, who had no beginning and no end. That is to transcend that linear time, that day after day that we observe. Luke 19, 39 to 40 says, Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he, Jesus, answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. <laughs> Praising God is so important. In doing that, we're giving him his due and we're stirring the Holy Spirit as God inhabits the praises of his people. That's why David and others would put the musicians out in front of them as they went into battle. You might think, well, that makes for some easy casualties up front. No, what it is, is that they're saying, yes, we're prepared to do what we need to do. But we know the Lord God, Jehovah, is the one who is going to give us the victory. <laughs> and he did. Whenever they were following his dictates and not the desires of their own hearts. Mark 11.10 says, and this reference scene, the cries of the people continuing, Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Oh, remember? Hosanna in the highest was how Jesus Christ was greeted in Matthew. And we know from the first chapter of that gospel that David is in the lineage of Jesus. Did you know that our Lord has a lot of color in his earthly father's lineage, that is Joseph's? We find there Jacob the trickster, Solomon the illegitimate child of Bathsheba, the upstanding Hezekiah and Josiah, 
the evil Ahaz and repentant of Manasseh. <laughs> and we're often just as colorful as part of the spiritual lineage of our father by Christ. We should be ever so thankful for his great love, forgiveness, and mercy. We want to reflect that glory and honor and power unto our father and his son through the spirit. Mark 11, 11 states, Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Jesus soon was to clear the temple of money changers as described in Matthew 21, 12 to 16. He was cleansing the temple. He was getting rid of all the evil, the earthly practices, the wickedness that had built up into that place. The money changers were set up in all likelihood in the court of the Gentiles, the only place non-believers could go to learn about the true and living God. But this area was now used to take advantage of people, primarily the holy people, the Jews, God's chosen, as they had to buy animals for sacrifice at inflated prices from temple operators. They also had to change their Roman money into so-called holy money, temple money, that wasn't quite as offensive to God. The priests told them that it was still made by a pagan and had a pagan emperor's imprint on it. <laughs> Do you think they might be just a little bit um, hypocritical? Yes, quite a lot. And we're going to see even more of that here in Matthew 26. We go to verses 56 through 58. All the disciples forsook him, Jesus, and fled. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Christ had come riding into Jerusalem just a little while earlier. And indeed, no one could stop Jesus as he taught. The religious leaders tried, but soon realized they were no match for him. Render unto Caesars what is Caesars, unto God what is God. And at that point, after he showed them that denarius, when they tried to catch him on the question of paying Roman taxes, they bothered him no more, knowing that they would just keep losing credibility ever so often. These cowards would not do their dirty work in the light of day, but they would wait until darkness and their hired men could come. These people with unreasoning hatred exist in our time, and they often want some veneer, some window dressing that looks like fairness and procedure have been observed as they falsely accuse the innocent. Well, don't believe them. Insist on facts and evidence. And when your friends are charged, don't abandon them. Be loyal, be truthful. And above all, don't deny Christ. If we deny him, he denies us, he tells us. It's much better to have he who can kill the soul and the body than to please he who can only kill the body. Matthew 26, 59 to 61 reads, now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. <laughs> Satan and his minions much of the time aren't too swift. The religious rulers' toadies are all against Jesus, but they can't get their story straight because they're fighting against the truth with capital T's. The law of Moses said two eyewitnesses had to agree in testimony on charges. Allowed by God, the two finally agree on a fib. 
Their accusation came from distorting John 2.19 when Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Speaking about the temple of his body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Notice he said others would destroy the temple, not him. You destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. <laughs> Don't believe liars. Matthew 26, 62 to 63 says, And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. This is another tactic of evil. Get the falsely accused to participate in sham proceedings. The father likely is telling his son, Jesus, to be silent. The high priest who runs the trial is getting frustrated. He wants this thing to end up. Why can't you guys get this right? <laughs> it's a little tough to conspire against God Almighty. And he wanted to show just exactly where their spirit came from. Matthew 26, 64 to 66 states, Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Jesus, if you look at the Greek, did not directly say he was Messiah, but the high priest lunged for it. His mind was made up before the proceeding. Christ must die. If we have to lie, that's fine. If we have to misrepresent, that's okay. This was the same official who said, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. John eleven forty nine 49 to 50. It doesn't matter that the one man is the Messiah for which we have waited hundreds and thousands of years. It doesn't matter that the man is completely innocent. It doesn't matter that if we would trust God on this and do what is right, we would be saved. That's the one who's leading this procession. Our look at Matthew 26 concludes with verses 67 and 68. Then they spat in his face, Jesus's, and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Hmm. Very spiritual people beating up a prisoner who likely was restrained. We see that this cowardice comes out and foes trying to cover themselves and trying to say, oh, there was no problem. Oh, it was all me uh, being able to be strong and tough. No, <laughs> those are the ones you got to watch. The one who never says he or she makes the mistake, that's the one that you better be a little suspicious about. We now conclude by looking at 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 18. Words of the great apostle Paul to his protege, Timothy, a young pastor. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 2 reads, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Even though the unsaved world hates the Lord, and increasingly abuses his servants, we Christians, especially those who are pastors, teachers, board members, and other leaders, we must continue to stand for God and the Bible. We're salt and light to our society. Salt preserves, it keeps it from completely rotting away. The light comes to expose the works of darkness so that they can be called out and they can be stopped. We need to encourage, convict, speak truth to power, and always point people to Jesus Christ. Woe is us if we are called, but we refuse God's great commission. Second Timothy 4, 3 to 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. 
Some Christian leaders are decking doing church discipline. Others foster false prophets, till others refuse to stand behind the whole of Scripture. Oh, if you just believe in the resurrection, it's all fine. The Bible says if we are not chastised, corrected, when we are wrong, we are not children of God. Should we speak from our own resources instead of the Lord's? We're not speaking by the Holy Spirit. And those who add or subtract from the word are cursed. The true prophets of old were unpopular for speaking God's counsel. The prosperity preachers of various sorts, oh, you can just continue on on your ways. You'll just be fine. Or yeah, if you give me some shekels, uh, I'll put in a good word to the Lord for you and you'll be okay. All of that's wrong and even to some extent blasphemy. Verses 5, to, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Isn't that beautiful? Paul was a learned man. He had great position and authority and trust of the ruling Pharisees. But Jesus Christ knocked him off his donkey one day, another donkey coming in handy, and said, why are you persecuting me, Paul? And Paul gave his life to Christ, was baptized for the remission of sins, received the Holy Spirit, and went on until his time was over on earth in the power of God, preaching Jesus is Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can turn around too whether it's getting saved or whether it's having the power of God, the Holy Spirit in you to be his witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of this earth. Paul here passes the spiritual baton to Timothy, who's his son in the faith. He was a young man. He had Jewish parents and he was brought up in those Old Testament scriptures, revering them, knowing that there was a God in heaven. Paul led him to Christ and they took him on saying, I think you've got a call, young man, to be a pastor in God's church. Oh, what a privilege, what a wondrous office to have to be a bishop as I am a pastor in God's house. Hmm. The apostle is tired and aging. He's probably in his mid to later 50s, pretty old for that day as opposed to Timothy, maybe late 20s, early 30s. Paul's gone through many trials. He's been stoned before. They were trying to kill him with these big stones thrown at him. He still survived. He was whipped 39 lashes, 40 minus one, several times, still survived. He was in a shipwreck in the deep, got washed up on the shore, endured so much at the hands of Jews and Gentiles, still going. But he knows it's about that time to go from this earth. He tells the next generation, get ready and go with God. Your number one duty is to evangelize. Spread the evangel, the good news that you can be saved. Your sins washed away, past, present, future. If you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Make him your Lord and Savior. You believe he was raised upon the third day from the grave and you confess faith in him. Mm. Yes, he who loses his life to Jesus Christ for his sake will find it. But he who tries to preserve his life upon this earth, this coronavirus <laughs> orb, he's going to lose it. He will not be in heaven. Second Timothy 4, 7 to 8 states, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Wonderful. This is what all of us should be able to say in our final days. I hope you could say that today. We never know what day, what hour our Lord is coming, right? Matthew 24. When we know God and are filled with the spirit, we don't doubt we will see the Lord in glory because that's his word. We'll receive crowns for that. We did it the right spirit for and in Jesus Christ. We can take our best day, make it a thousand times better, and we'll still be short of how wonderful seeing Jesus face to face is going to be. 9 to 15 reads, 
Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Christians for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Antichicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. The apostle tells us that the Christian life isn't easy. And I would say that about all of us who have been in this walk a while would raise our hands in agreement with that. People come in and out of it, seemingly faithful, turning out to be pretenders sometimes. But some surprise us and do exceedingly well, better than we could ever have asked or imagined in Jesus Christ. And that's what we live for as the people of God to bring people into the faith, to nurture them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and to send them out to tell others about this great salvation. Oh, for woe is unto us if we neglect so great a salvation. Second Timothy 4.16 says, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Paul was brought up on false charges. Just like with Jesus, his helpers scattered to the wind. He wasn't bitter. He prayed for them, just as our Lord did. Oh, Father, they do not know what they do. Do not count this against them. Can you imagine that you have lived a perfect life? You've tried to save these folks who are now killing you. You preach to them the truth. You're an agony of a sort that I don't think either you or I could imagine. And yet you say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. (laughs) An amazing love, amazing love. 2 Timothy 4.17 reads, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of a lion. (laughs) It was almost Paul in the lion's den, along with Daniel. God delivered them both. (laughs) The Lord gave the apostles strength to do his will, deliver his testimony, and emerge victorious over all. Death could not hold him, (laughs) just like our Lord, because he believed so hard and strong and testified of Jesus Christ everywhere he went. God's going to do the same to us today. He'll raise us up in that blessed and holy first resurrection, if only we are saved and confess him. The key for us is simple. We just remain faithful. If we fail, we ask God's forgiveness. We get back up again and we keep on going. The concluding verse for us today, 2 Timothy 4, 18. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So be it. Amen. (laughs) That's what it means in Aramaic. If we keep doing what God said to do, then we'll get the result he said we'd get. We don't calculate the obedience to the Lord. Well, if I do this, uh, he'll let me overlook that. No, we just do what's right and we trust him to fight for us. And he does much more effectively than we could ever think. We must know as we go through these last days on earth that scripture is more real, accurate, and true than anything else. We must trust it completely. The TV is manipulating what's before our eyes, the internet as well. One day, I believe these channels will bear the false image of a resurrected beast, the Antichrist. They'll convince many people that he's actually God, that he's actually the Christ because he rose again, but he didn't. It's a pseudo Christ is what it says in Greek, looking like it, but actually the opposite thereof. Be careful of those who misrepresent. Do you need to trust Jesus this Palm Sunday and have the strength to endure with him? Unlike those who laid those branches before him, What we have to do is repent, turn from our sins. We say that we are sorry to our God for what we have done against him. Maybe we did it in ignorance. Maybe we did it in purpose. 
A lot of people like to flout God today. But we turn from it now by his power. We make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior in our lives by putting him on the throne of it. It's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And what he's going to do is change us into his image day by day. Those little tests and trials that you have, those will begin to work on your character and make it more like Christ's, just as they have me. It's a process. It's a relationship. It's not just a one-time event. We also have to believe that Jesus Christ rose from that tomb on the third day that we're going to celebrate on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, that death could not hold him, that he holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and he's not giving them to anyone. He will judge the quick and the dead upon his appearing. This world is headed to self-destruction. You see what's happening now. Why don't you, if you want to be part of Jesus' kingdom, kingdom of God, Pray after me as I cover these elements. Dear Father God, I am a sinner. I repent of my sins. I turn from them by your power. I confess faith in Jesus Christ. I believe he rose on the third day from the grave. Bodily. I trust Jesus Christ and his way as Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, Holy Spirit, and save me. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. And if you have prayed that, sincerely, you are set free. You are not a slave to sin anymore. Uh, the laws of sin and death don't apply to you. If you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ's Holy Spirit that he has sent, having ascended on high, and he will intercede for you, and those sins will be washed away. You have power to overcome as well, to get rid of the desire for those sins, and to serve Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to Tell others of him as I'm telling you now to teach them. You have spiritual gifts that God himself has given you and no man can take away. Go ahead and use them. Use them with Christians on the street, in your apartment building, wherever you can, on the phone, on video. Let's pray for that power to testify and to live for Christ till the day we are taken up by death and rapture. Gracious Father God, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you, Lord God, for each person getting this message. Lord God, I pray that you will help us to live the life of Christ till we go to be with you, whatever manner it be. Lord God, but let us testify of salvation in Christ, sanctification, and the Holy Spirit's power until that day. Oh, Lord God, we pray, put somebody in our path today that we can tell about Jesus Christ. Help us to get rid of these sins and we repent of all of those that we have and we do not lay it to the charge of those who've done us wrong. We say, oh Lord, just draw them and save them and change them. Lord God, we thank you that we can appeal to you in Jesus' name. Give us power, fill us all the more with the Holy Spirit. Let us be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Let us be witnesses to you in our little town, in our county, in our state, in our nation, and in our world. For this in every age, in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Oh, it's so good to be with you today. I wish I could be there in person to shake your hand and give you a big hug. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. This Palm Sunday, we'll see you next week for Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. Not about bunnies, <laughs> but it's going to be about God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you.